if he isn't God Almighty in human flesh, that he can't save anyone in the 20th century. If he's only a perfect man, he can only substitute his life for one other man. That's the law. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. How could he, dying 1900 years ago, save you and me? Only one way if he were God, that his infinite life would equal the sum total of all human life which he himself created. God literally substituted himself on that cross for the whole world, praise God. God was in Christ, said Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.19, reconciling the world unto himself. John said, this is the true God, 1 John 5.21. And people say, well, nowhere do you hear that, he, that he's called God. What are you talking about? Why, even the Father calls the Son God. Hebrews 1, 8, quoting Psalm 45. We have in John uh, 1, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. What's the matter with us? I and the Father are one. They knew exactly what He said. He, they didn't mean one in spirit or like they have the same mission in life. No, they knew exactly what he said. They picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy, for making himself equal with God. Look, my friends, God Almighty became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. we got to get back to the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And stop watering down Jesus, my majestic King of kings and Lord of lords. One final thing about this terrible time called perilous times. We mentioned that uh, the pursuit of self-love will dominate the culture. The passion for pleasure will replace one's commitment to God. The practice of religion will increase, but without the power of God. The persecution of the godly will intensify, and the presence of widespread deception will lead the majority of believers, professing believers, away from the truth of God's Word. And finally, number six, the priority of the scriptures will be the major issue of genuine faith and practice. Look please at what he said in verse 14. His last words. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. And that from a child, the word is brephos in Greek, which is a baby born or a new baby. From a baby thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's only three words in Greek. Every writing God breathed. If you want to know what we think about this subject in detail, it's in our book called Living in the Last Days, First and Second Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished, really complete, unto all good works. I got to thinking about that. You know, in our culture, we got a problem now with the Bible. A serious problem. We have folks not knowing which translation to read from. Which one do I get? We have a massive effort to prove that the King James is archaic. I have a book in my library. There are 5,000 so-called archaic words in the King James that are still used in secular society. All it does is show how the words are used in the secular news all over the world. So obviously they're not archaic. You know what the problem is? It's dumbing down of English. And so now we have versions that are being uh, more palatable to people, in which they take liberties with the text. So we don't even know what the actual words are, but it's sort of the thought that counts, people say. Do you understand what's happening? When I grew up, and many of you with gray hair will know what I'm talking about, uh, we only had one Bible. It was the King James. And I'm not a King James only freak, so don't misunderstand. But I have taught about Greek manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts, and I have done work on translation. So I'm not standing here as a fool yelling at you. I'm here warning you as, a, as one who is reading God's Word and seeing what's happening. You understand, we used to memorize God's Word. Now it's hard to find anybody that knows any scripture at all. They don't know which translation to have the kids memorize it. And then if they try, here's an interesting thing. In most 
efforts to sell you a modern Bible, let's say a modern English translation of the Bible, they always have to undermine the King James. Did you notice that? They always have to do it. Why? Because the King James still outsells all the rest of them. As a matter of fact, you may not know this, the King James Bible is actually having sort of a revival. And guess who's buying it? The kids. We have a secular research organization that shows that little children will learn the King James Bible easier than any other English translation. And parents look at that and say, are you sure? Absolutely. Why? Because the fewest multi-syllabic words are used in King James. King James will say no, and the new translation will say comprehend or understand. You see, the words are simpler. Kids can follow it a little easier. There are some words, sure, that sound uh, crazy uh, to modern English. A kid came up to me and said, well, I don't understand the King James. I said, what don't you understand? He said, the word half. I said, well, that's has. You got anything else? He looked at me and said, I know there must be something. Well, how about all those ye and these? I said, well, that's interesting because you see the King James is the only text that will tell you whether you're talking to one person or to two or more. You see, thee is always singular and ye is always plural. But in modern English, you, that applies to both, you never know what you're talking about. And sometimes that affects major doctrines in the Bible. Very interesting. People say, oh, who cares about those little details? Well, God did. He cared about the usage of the word seed. Why, even the grammatical form and how it was used in the Bible as to whether it was singular or plural with its pronouns. And says in Galatians 3 that when God promised the seed, he was talking about Christ. A seed, not of many, but of one. You know, I could go on and on. Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass away till all be fulfilled. A jot, a yod, is the smallest letter in the Hebrew language. A tittle is a marking on one letter to distinguish it from another. The truth is, the Word of God was written in Hebrew with some portions in Ezra and Daniel and Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. So in those original autographs, which we don't have, but have thousands of manuscripts from, we in fact have confidence in the Word of God. And what we have in modern English is a looseness about the Word of God. Oh, it doesn't really make any difference, does it? Oh, yes, it does. You see, I believe this is the Word of God. I don't make it the Word of God. It already is the Word of the living God. And that's so important to understand because we have a whole generation of so-called Bible scholars who are undermining people's confidence in the Bible. They're telling folks they can't understand the Bible. I know there's some things hard to understand, but I want to make this clear. It's not what I don't understand in the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do understand that bothers me. Amen. There are children who can read this. Many times at the table when our kids were small, we would have them read every day. We'd rotate and they'd read the Bible and I'd ask them what they meant. I found time after time, even though I had studied in seminary and studied those languages, what my kids thought it meant was what it meant. It's like a guy the other day says, you know, I'm doing a real in-depth study on the word fear. What, it, what does it mean when it says fear the Lord? I said, well, I've done that study. I can save you the time. He said, really? Uh, can you give me your research? I'll give it to you right now. I don't even have to give you any paper on it. He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I know it might be surprising, but fear means fear. Isn't it interesting how people are dealing with subjects that are so obvious? You see, who's behind this? Who's behind this? Oh, I know in some respects we talk about the Bible pub publishers and that, you know, the bottom line is selling Bibles and so it's the dollar that's, you know, behind it and all of that. No, wait a minute. Who is behind rephrasing what God says? We call it the garden syndrome. It's Satan himself. The God of this world is deceiving people.